Well, it's, um, it's an absolute delight to be here this evening in such a, a splendid venue. And I have to say, of, of all the venues that we've, we've had over the past 12 months for lectures for the, the Grinling Gibbons Tercentenary, I think that this is probably the most appropriate, um, given the, the fantastic connections that you're going to hear more about tonight between the, the cravat, war pole, and the wearing of this art unto deception. This is our second to last event for the Grinling Gibbons Tercentenary. It's been a phenomenal year. We've had exhibitions, lectures, music, projects, and education. And I'm really thrilled that we are rounding it off with something as special as this. And I, I think it, it doesn't need a lot of explanation as to why an event such as this is so special when you, you gaze upon, well, the recreations of Gibbons's cravat. It's one of those iconic objects that, that most people will have come across or have heard of at some point. And it, it casts wonderment whenever people see what he has managed to create from a piece of wood. And so tonight, I'm really hopeful that not only are we able to celebrate these wonderful works of art, but ponder about the questions that they provoke. And they do indeed provoke questions. And for me, that's probably the most exciting part out of it. I'm really very, very pleased to be introducing Martin Possle tonight as the, the chair of this event and the four fabulous speakers who have kindly come together to present. I won't say any more because that's Martin's, Martin's job. But um, my heartfelt thanks on behalf of the GGS to Strawberry Hill for putting this on, allowing us to be in this spectacular room tonight. And Martin, can I, can I hand to you to, to get things underway? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Hannah. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm wearing two hats tonight. I'm not, I'm wearing, I'm not even wearing a cravat, but I'm wearing two hats. Um, I'm uh, a trustee of Strawberry Hill, and uh, I'm also um, somebody who has uh, a long-term interest in the 18th century. Uh, I'm a research fellow uh, senior research fellow at the Paul Mellon Centre for Study in British Art. And I just want to say a few words before we begin. I mean, the, the, the word cravat uh, immediately, of course, brings up Leslie Phillips, uh, because, <laughs> you know, why wouldn't it, obviously? <laughs> mm, ding dong. Um, but going, you know, and the other thing is Tony Hancock's landlady, of course. <laughs> Mrs. Cravat. Who could ever forget Mrs. Cravat? And now... Um, Grinling Gibbons was quite simply an original genius, a citizen of nature. I wish I'd thought of it first, but I didn't. Horace Walpole did, and that's what Horace Walpole calls him in his Anecdotes of Painting, 1762. An original genius, how can you not be an original genius? A citizen of nature. Walpole was only four years old when Grinling Gibbons died in 1721, and yet he revered his achievement from a very early age. His father, Sir Robert Walpole, owned the splendid portrait of Grinling Gibbons by Godfrey Neller, which was displayed at his country seat, Houghton Hall, uh, on an overmantel framed within a gilt wall garland by Gibbons. And while the portrait later found its way in Walpole's life into the collection of the Russian Empress, Catherine the Great, Gibbons' gar gilded garland thankfully remained at Houghton. Remains at Houghton. During his peregrinations around country houses from the 1740s, Horace Walpole took time to appreciate Gibbons' work at various grand residences, including Burley House, Hurstmonceau Castle, and Petworth, where, although he actually intensely disliked the architecture, he marvelled at the decorations in the so-called carved room, which contained, he said, much the finest carving of Gibbons' that my, ever my eyes beheld. There are birds absolutely feathered, and the two antique vases with bath reliefs are as perfect and beautiful as if they were carved by a Grecian master. Turning the focus to this evening's event, 
Gibbons' celebrated cracked. It was given to Walpole in 1769, a gift from his friend Grosvenor Bedford, who was his deputy at the Exchequer and who had himself commissioned a portrait of Horace Walpole by Joshua Reynolds. At Strawberry Hill, the Gibbons cravat usually resided in a glass case adjacent to his rosewood cabinet of miniatures and enamels in the Tribune, just across the way. But as I'm sure many of you, I'm sure all of you know, the cravat's most celebrated exposition was at a party thrown in May 1769, as he described in a letter to his friend George Montague, and I have to read it out because it's wonderful. This is Horace to George Montague, 11th of May, 1769. Strawberry has been in great glory. I have given a festino there that will almost mortgage it. It's always hyperbole with Horace. Last Tuesday, all France dined here. Monsieur and Madame du Châtelet, the Duc de Liancourt, three more French ladies whose name you will find in the enclosed paper, eight other Frenchmen, the Spanish and Portuguese ministers, the Holdernesses, Fitzroys. In short, we were four and 20. <laughs> they arrived at two. At the gates of the castle, I received them dressed in the cravat of Gibbons's carving and a pair of gloves embroidered up to the elbows that had belonged to James I. The French servants stared and firmly believed that this was the dress of English country gentlemen. <laughs> what a hoot. The party continued with a tour of Strawberry Hill, a visit to Horace's printing house, Alexander Pope's celebrated grotto, situated just down the road, followed by a magnificent dinner uh, in Walfell's refectory, and the company played card games until midnight before dispersing at 1 a.m. Now that's stamina for you. <laughs> As we know, the cravat continued to reside at Strawberry Hill long after Walpole's death, until, with so much of the collection, it was sold in that epic auction of 1842. And since 1928, it has been in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And so, uh, with this little prologue, I'd, without further ado, invite our first speaker, Nick Humphrey, to the podium. He will pass the baton to our other speakers who are going to talk for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll all have some meaningful conversation. Okay, over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I must say, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that there aren't more ties on display. I, I, can't, I can't see a single bow tie anywhere. You'd have, you'd have got a free drink, I'm sure, if you'd, if you'd, if you'd managed it. Um, so I've, I've brought one. In fact, I've brought two because uh, here at the front, um, not the original uh, carving of the cravat, I'm afraid, which is still on display at the V&A in our... Uh, fashioning masculinities exhibition, and it looks wonderful there, I, I should say. But but I have brought uh, a 3D printed replica here at Strawberry Hill. You'll know all about the marvels of uh, 3D replication. Uh, so the white one is the uh, nylon replica, and next to it, as you're going to hear in greater detail, uh, is the wonderful uh, partly finished replica uh, produced just last year uh, for the Tercentenary by Clooney Fretton, who's also with us. Um, in so many ways, Walpole's cravat is a curious piece. After he'd received it, the history is well documented, as Martin has outlined. And of course, since 1928, it's been a preeminent treasure at the V&A, much admired, occasionally lent for exhibition elsewhere, including several years ago here at Strawberry Hill. No mention of the cravat survives from Gibbon's own times, but Walpole was certainly convinced it was Gibbon's work. That conviction involved what was no more, in fact, than a rumour recorded by George Virtue that Gibbon's introduction to Charles II by John Evelyn culminated in Gibbon's <coughs> presenting the king with a, quote, curiously carved point cravat, now, that story that Virtue tells is baseless, clearly. Uh, but the attribution to Gibbons has stood the test of time. 
the VNA, I and colleagues, our view favours a hypothesis that Gibbons made it perhaps in the mid to late 1680s when it would have been building on the success of Gibbons' greatest work, perhaps uh, his individual work, the so-called Cosimo panel, that he'd made it perhaps as a demonstration of his artistic genius and technical skill, the kind of thing that might be pulled casually out from a drawer or plucked from the wall as uh, a demonstration of his artistic genius and technical skills, uh, perhaps therefore kept in, uh, at his premises in Covent Garden. And that idea fits with what we know of Gibbon's own flair for self-promotion. In the window of his house at Ludgate Hill, a few years earlier, we know that he displayed a carved flower pot of light wood so thin and fine that the coaches passing by made them shake surprisingly. Turning the cravat over in one's hands, as I've been lucky enough to do, it's possible to appreciate its open form and the insubstantiality of the carving where the soft folds of lace resemble the outline of a scallop shell. That, that unconventional view of it. Where the soft folds of lace resemble the outline of a scallop shell. The cravat is carved from a single block of lime wood, probably Tilia Europea, and yet it weighs less than 150 grams, no more than an apple. There's, incidentally, if, if you, you, you come and uh, you've got very clean hands and you're very careful and you want to pick up the nylon 3D print, you'll find that that weighs twice as much. Um, and that's one of the shocking things about handling Gibbon's original. Looking at the original, there's no sign of any broken connections or other indication that it formed part of a larger carved ensemble. It was a single integral work. The back, completely plain, and that's what we're seeing here. Or I should say rather, plain other than the slicing cuts left by the chisel blades, suggesting that Gibbons expected it to be hung on the wall or held in the hand, perhaps. And that economy of carving is particularly striking, wasting no effort on areas that would not be seen. Close physical examination as we have able to do when it comes into our conservation studios, and the recent micro-CT scans that have been carried out at the Natural History Museum, we're looking at a thickness map um, in this multicoloured version. It, it wasn't ever coloured like that, I should, have, should say. Give us some more information about it. Demonstrating, for example, where Gibbons cut the lime wood down to as little as a millimetre thickness in the blue areas. Again, you, you can see that for yourself on the replica. Or demonstrating, for example, uh, I'm sorry this is not such an easy image to see, that within the cravat there are no metal pins or separate sections have, have been joined together. It really is definitively carved from a single block. You can even see the grain of the wood passing all the way through it. We can also see that the cravat has suffered two breaks in the past where red lines on this scan image highlight glue repairs to the bow. Those repairs were carried out in about 1985. Um, an early, rather technical use of superglue, you might be surprised to know. <laughs> At some point, uh, a hole, which has been highlighted in blue here, right in the centre of the knot, was drilled through for a metal pin from which it must have been hung, but there's no way of telling exactly when that was done. On the front of the carving, the scan even picks up, and it's here highlighted in, in yellow, even picks up the dust from an application of lime wash that remains in the crevices, presumably applied at some point to freshen up its whiteness. And there's no way of dating when that lime wash treatment was was added, but it's, it, it wouldn't have been surprising for it to have happened on several occasions during its um, several hundred years. With this level of detail, we can appreciate how Gibbon's approach combined artistic vision with technical mastery and a profound understanding of Lionwood's qualities. But why carve lace? Why in the form of a cravat? Gibbon's appears to have been the first to carve lace from wood, 
but he would certainly have known of lace cravats carved in marble, a long established and very high status artistic tradition. A lace trimmed collar features prominently in the V&A's own 1638 bust portrait of Thomas Baker by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, leading sculptor of his day, when Baker visited Rome on behalf of King Charles I. Um, that's the bust of Baker, which you can see in the Masculinities exhibition if you're visiting. Lace also features prominently in the portrait of Charles II here by Gibbon's associate and assistant in 1678, Arnold Quellin. So working in London, one of his uh, expert associates, by association with marble sculpture, carving lace for Gibbons would have been a deliberate and stylishly articulated way for Gibbons to demonstrate his own artistic ambitions and technical skills. He's really raising the bar and suggesting he's far more than a, than a workaday woodcarver. He's in a different league. Like white marble, limewood is well suited to lace because the shadows that define sculptural forms are emphasised by the paleness of the material. The raised structure of point lace, and we're going to hear much more about it from Sylvia, suits the play of light and shade and the representation of depth achieved in Gibbon's hands by skillfully undercutting the wood behind. Of course, limewood allows far greater scope than marble for cutting fine, almost microscopic detail, a convincing illusion that works both at a distance and close up. And that's not the same for marble. It's hard to understand uh, a life-sized, standalone, life-sized, life sized cravat carved out of marble, even by Bernini. And that little detail of Quellin's marble cravat, you can, you can see the thickness. There's up close, you would never for a moment think of it as, as a lacy um, medium. In late 17th century England, there was particular interest and delight in artistic illusion and the convincing even deceptive simulation of one material with another. Contemporary auction notes advertise still life paintings featuring cravats. Mention is even made of a painting that depicts a carved cravat. Could this have been the very one that Walpole bought later, or that Walpole was given later? Or was it the work of a follower or a competitor of Gibbons, suggesting that the idea of carving a cra cravat had quickly caught the public imagination, that 1689 or 90. We, we don't know exactly when uh, the, the Walpole cravat was carved. Intriguingly, on certain occasions, a wooden cravat could mean something entirely separate. In this popular song at the bottom here, a wooden cravat I believe I shall wear and after a rope will come to my share. Here, wearing a wooden cravat refers to a criminal standing in the stocks, the stocks being the wooden cravat, while another phrase of the period, dancing in a hempen cravat, meant the dreadful leg twitching of someone dying in the hangman's noose if the neck hadn't been, hadn't been broken immediately by the drop. Grim stuff. In Gibbon's day, cravats were such conspicuous fashion accessories, they were frequently mentioned in plays as a motif mocking the vanity and pretensions of male characters that the audience would have been expected to understand immediately. A mere bow is a creature compounded of peruke or wig, cravat, cravat string and fine cloths, an amorous glance, a white hand and a diamond ring on the finger. While a play from 1696, the character of the bow, has a nice affected bow tying on his cravat, which perhaps is done and undone a dozen times before it sets with an air according to his mind. In this Parisian shop view, of 1678, so probably a few years earlier, uh, the dandy is wearing at one, while other cravats, ready tied, are displayed on the shelves behind. You might just be able to make those out above wigs and stockings here. Cravats were so distinctive and nuanced an accessory at this period that they carried a wealth of contemporary associations 
featuring frequently in broadside ballads, the popular songs of the day, often with connotations of sexual pleasure, whether it's from having your cravat tied, ho-ho, or tying the marriage knot in a more uh, respectable form. The type of cravat depicted by Gibbons was fashionable right across Europe in the 1680s. It's really starting to go out of fashion by the early 1690s, as we can see from contemporary portraits like this uh, splendid example, a French example, on the right. The type consists of three elements, lace ends, a neck piece and a bow. Two panels of deeply worked needle lace, rectangles, hang in heavy folds, and these were stitched at each, end, at each end of a length of muslin or lawn, a fine enough fabric to be tied in a neat, tight knot. That wraparound piece is then combined with, a, with usually a coloured knot, like a stiff silk bow tie. So imagine you're at home getting dressed, perhaps aided by a servant, or, like Samuel Pepys in 1659, you're at the barber's to have your cravat dressed. You knot the central length of lightweight cloth around the neck and arrange the two hanging lace end panels so that they overlap in a kind of ruffle. Now some wearers stop at this point, or the cravat could be further adorned with a colourful silk bow made of taffeta. That's what we're seeing here, a completely separate element. Taffeta, very useful because it's stiff enough to protrude either side. These kind of bows, called cravat strings at the time, were probably created by taking a wide ribbon, folding it twice lengthwise, and then pulling it through the knot of the cravat before tying it. Alternatively, they might be separate and worn over or under the muslin portion of the cravat wrapped around the neck. Cravats were not only complicated, as that description probably suggests, and indeed expensive if they're made of the best lace, but a highly cultivated practice. At the French court, a specific individual, the cravatier, was responsible for the care and choice of the royal cravats. Somebody expert in straightening the king's collar, draping, tying the cravat, although apparently the privilege of tying the final knot was reserved for the king himself. As Randall Holm, 1688, commented on cravats at the time, there is so many new ways of making it, would, it would be a task to name much more describe them. We're probably grateful for that. It may actually be that Gibbon's cravat represents a ready-made cravat, the lace and bow sewn to a band which tied at the back of the neck, a very convenient solution to the vexing challenge of tying a complicated two-piece cravat that stays in place and doesn't go wonky. Um, and as someone who re discovered recently at a, at a university reunion that he could no longer manage to tie his own bow tie after, several, after a few decades without bothering uh, into anything approaching respectability, I have new respect for the ready-made ready, ready bow tie. All in all, then, it's important to remember that with the Strawberry Hill cravat, Gibbons was not trying to replicate flattened lace in all its intricate detail, as I think he did with greater accuracy in other carvings. What he was after was to depict the truthful appearance of one of these complicated three-part fashion accessories designed to set off two superimposed, gently gathered lace panels, arguably a much tougher challenge, artistic as well as technical, than merely replicating lace. Now, Gibbons knew all about cravats, and indeed lace. Not only was he mixing in very fashionable English society, but he'd grown up as the son of a wealthy draper that, as, uh, in, in Rotterdam uh, from an English family. But as a freeman and later warden of the, London's dra the London Drapers' Company, um, not uh, by virtue of the fact that he sold luxury textiles like the other drapers, but by virtue of his father's business, Gibbons would have been familiar with leading lace merchants and their products. And this 1691 portrait of Gibbons and his wife shows an extremely smartly dressed couple. He wears a wig, 
very fashionable in shape and length, an informal Indian gown, presumably of silk, worn over a waistcoat, providing strong associations of culture and artistic refinement. And the finishing touch is a cravat with lace ends, so no bow on this one, and matching lace cuffs of needle lace, an up-to-date style, a combination that accentuates his head and his hands, intelligence and ability. The same qualities, I'd say, that are expressed so well by the limewood cravat that Walpole took such delight in. Uh, and now I'm very glad to pass over to Sash Giles, Curator of Decorative Arts of the Devonshire Collections, to take us into the next step. Well, I'm, thank you so much for this invitation. I've really been looking forward to, to coming and sharing some thoughts with you. Um, so in the time I've got to show you, I'm going to show you the Chatsworth cravat, so I'll begin with that immediately, and provide some background about its time at Chatsworth. I'll also briefly look at some other examples of carved lace and offer some thoughts on the authorship of the Chatsworth cravat. I'll begin by noting that there are as many people who claim the cravat to be by Grinling Gibbons as by Samuel Watson, and for those unfamiliar with him, I'll introduce Samuel properly shortly. My position is that evidentially I side with Watson, or even one of the other talented carvers working at Chatsworth, and more on them and on. Trevor Brighton's 1998 article in the Burlington magazine firmly places authorship with Watson, whilst others, including H. Avery Tipping and David Esterly, sided with Gibbons, and I can only respect their opinions and knowledge. After what I have to show you, it might be fun to have a show of hands to gauge what you all think. But before we begin in earnest, I wanted to share an extract from Old Hall's Manners and Families of Derbyshire, published in 1892 <coughs> by Joseph Tilley, who expressed his feelings about the interior carvings at Chatsworth as follows. Most visitors to Chatsworth come away with the idea that they have seen exquisite carving by Grinling Gibbons. Even in spite of the challenge of license and evidence produced by Cox and Jewett, writers will persist in recapitulating this egregious blunder. Can any living man point to any proof of any work in Chatsworth being by Gibbons? We say proof that will stand powder and shot. Truthfully, no one had ever heard of Gibbons ever having been at Chatsworth or doing any work for Chatsworth until egotistical Walpole <laughs> walked in one day and pronounced the carvings to be by Gibbons. I absolutely admire Tilly's conviction, and his delivery for me underscores the emotional attachments that seem ever-present in discussions around authorship of these carved works. So the Chatsworth Cravat is recorded by September 1793, when the assemblage was noticed in the cursory view of that date, as located in the ballroom or dancing gallery, the present-day library and probably earlier, in the 1764 inventory in the Great Gallery, also the present-day library, housed in a glass case. The cravat is surrounded by a songbird, flowers and leaves, pods and a portrait medallion. Carved from limewood, the cravat itself is so finely carved as to test the very wood itself. And it's because of this there are areas of losses noticeably along the lower pico edge. Comparison of the verso and the V&A cravats reveals just how finely carved the Chatsworth example is. The linking bars between the denser lace motifs, only a millimetre thick in places, the wood has been deeply carved and there are lots of losses to these linking elements. The V&A piece in contrast is much more robust and it's a testament to given skill that the substructure is invisible from the front, making the cravat appear less dense than it truly is. And there's a close-up of the two fronts. Now, I've measured the Chatsworth cravat yesterday, and it's 46 centimetres long, which on, on me, I'm going to position it up here um, because it, it ends down there. So it is two-thirds larger um, than the, the Walpole example, which I think is kind of interesting and might be an interesting avenue to pursue in future. However, it's the medallion that's an interesting inclusion 
um, but it doesn't help to identify the maker of the cravat. It resembles at least one known portrait of Gibbons, but whether a self-portrait or an acknowledgement of his skill and influence, it's impossible to say. So we've got two images of Gibbons here. Um, it's also possible that the medal depicts Watson, or indeed one of the other carvers who worked at Chatsworth too. Frustratingly, a portrait of Watson did exist, said to have been painted by James Thornhill. It was in the possession of his grandson, White Watson, who lived in Bakewell, close to Chatsworth, a painting I hope will one day resurface. Lace can be found at Petworth and in the Cosimo panel. This is the Petworth panel here um, with the lace in the centre there. In the Cosimo panel, where it's presented as a longer piece there, still with the folds. And also, less familiarly, at Cullen and Hackwood Park. These two images have been taken from early country lives. The Cullen panel... Um, was last seen in 1972, and that was when the house was turned into apartments. So it's hoped that, as it didn't appear in the sale catalogue at the time, that it's somewhere still inside. Um, the Hackwood panel is even less um, obvious, and it seems to have been moved from one property to the other in the 1730s. Um, Hackwood, excitingly, is on the market at the moment. So if you happen to be perusing Christie's International, mm -hmm. fancy going and having a look... Their photographs are oblique, so I can't get a good angle. So, you know, just go and have a look, take a snap, and, and let me know what you think. Mm -hmm. So, who is this Samuel Watson that we've been talking about? So, he came from Hena in Derbyshire and was apprenticed to Charles Oakey and is known to have worked at Burley with Joel Lobb, Roger Davis, and Thomas Young and first appears in the records at Chatsworth in 1690. Watson was part of what might be described as a collective of carvers. Working at Chatsworth, he is afforded a lesser status than Masters Young and Lobb, when on the 9th of September 1692, the three made a contract, along with Roger Davis, to carve the ornaments of lime tree work for the Great Chamber, according to the design approved by his lord. That's the first Duke of Devonshire. The carving was to be as good or better than any such like work is hitherto done. In the event, Young didn't sign the agreement, so the work was completed by Lobb, Watson and Davis. Along with his carvings in both stone and wood, we have a volume of drawings, revealing that Watson was, in addition to being a talented carver, was a skilled and respected draftsman, and he proposed two architectural elevations for the West Front. So you can see, um, if you're at all familiar with Chatsworth, what, what was actually built um, rather resembles this um, frontage. Um, but with the um, addition of the, some of the carving that you see in this one. So his role's kind of complex and, and not defined. We've also, in the volume, got some beautifully sensitive um, drawings by Watson. So he was clearly observing and gathering ideas and material, and it's thanks to his grandson that we have those at all. We also know that Watson made himself familiar with the work of Gibbons, and this much reproduced drawing shows the altar carving at St James Piccadilly. Mm -hmm. It's annotated with um, a poem, um, which it, it's, it's not entirely taken from um, Dante, but it's clearly been inspired by. Um, and this uh, is by James John Carpenter, and it kind of confused Avery Tipping. He thought that, um, that he was the author of the drawing, but actually he was the author of the poem. Um, but there's one drawing in particular in the volume um, that we're particularly interested in. So this is a proposed overdoor, and some ele elements of which did make it into a final design, still extant in the overdoor from the state bedroom to the state dressing room. And if you're familiar yeah. with Chatsworth, they're the final spaces in that enfilade of room in the state apartments. The drawing centres on a lace cravat, and the proximity of which to a coronet and portrait medallion immediately suggests a familiarity with the Cosimo panel. Curiously, although Watson does not appear in the records until 1690, mm. he, or to be clear, the team of Lobb, Watson and Davis, chose to include a portrait medallion of King Charles II in the finished overdoor. Charles died in 1685, so why at the time of William and Mary, 
an image of a deceased pro-Catholic king from an old re regime should be included is still a mystery. Whilst Gibbon's name was not initially associated with the cravat, nor was Watson's, however, he was credited as the author of a famous pen, described by Horace Walpole as light as a feather. The initial creamy white colour of the fresh limewood must have added to the trompe l'oeil effect. The deception was so great, it too became part of the Gibbons at Chatsworth myth. The sixth Duke of Devonshire, in his 1844 handbook, described the Chatsworth tradition, which says that Gibbon made the pen to deceive Verio, and Verio the fiddle to deceive Gibbon. And here the Duke's referring to the famous trompe l'oeil violin, which <laughs> was in fact painted by Van der Vaart. So we've got um, pertinent names being inserted for, for the real ones. And I have just recently uncovered a photograph from around 1900, which actually shows the pen. Um, and that's the only record we have of it in situ. It's part of an overdoor, um, which is an allegory of design. So I'll be writing that up and sharing that soon. So that's terrifically exciting. Um, the sixth Duke, along with his sisters and mother, was taught mineralogy by White Watson, the same grandson of Samuel, who carefully preserved his grandfather's drawings. But even this living connection to Watson could not prevent the finely wrought working wood being given over to Gibbons. It's possible the assemblage of carvings were acquired as a curiosity either by the first or second dukes. However, we have no record of their purchase and the association with Gibbons only begins after Walpole names Gibbons as the author. So in summary, we know that Watson along with Young, Lobb and Davis worked at Chatsworth. We have drawings, including one depicting a point lace cravat by Watson in the collection. Watson was associated with one piece of virtuoso standalone carving, the pen. Gibbons never worked at Chatsworth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and I'd be delighted to hear your thoughts. Um, but for now I'm going to hand over to Sylvia who's going to tell us more about lace. now realize that I should not have used this template for my presentation. <laughs> so please disregard the logo. Um, <laughs> a creature of habit. Uh, so um, uh, Nick's brilliant talk served as an amazing introduction to uh, my contribution and I will be uh, focusing on uh, lace in uh, Gibbons's carvings and I thought that the uh, um, best detail to start with is um, this uh, partially folded uh, handkerchief um, uh, edged with uh, lace that um, is partially obscured with musical instruments and uh, notes at Bedford uh, House. Um, it is fairly easy to recognize that this type of lace, um, uh, the type of lace that served um, as the model or as the inspiration, and it's a Milanese uh, bobbin uh, lace where the characteristic uh, very softly rounded leaves uh, are made of a tape-like strip and the motifs uh, could have been uh, joined by bars or they could have been placed against the mesh ground. And it was a lace with the mesh ground that Gibbons chose. So the ideal uh, comparative example in this case uh, would have the pattern similar to the um, one of the bottom border and the mesh ground as the lace above. You can, I hope, <laughs> see the small holes uh, that appear in fairly regular intervals along the tape strip uh, of the bottom border and on the equivalent detail on the carving. So here Gibbons carved uh, uh, very convincingly a Milanese bobbin lace border and generally speaking bobbin laces uh, have a flat appearance and that is for the simple reason uh, of the technique being very similar to weaving. 
As for the fame, cravat, flat, is surely the last word that will come to mind. And here it certainly wasn't a bobbin lace that served as the model. It was needle lace uh, of technique that has much in common with embroidery and a very particular type of needle lace uh, characterized by a high relief structure that was impossible to achieve with bobbins. It was this extravagant texture that made this lace original, fashionable and eye-wateringly expensive. And it is not at all surprising that Gibbons um, found it quite appealing. And I like to think that our uh, Michelangelo of, of uh, wood carving uh, found it hard to resist the challenge of translating the sculptural qualities of this particular type of lace into wood. Um, the patterns of Girl Point de Venise are bold and profoundly three-dimensional. And the greatest novelty of this lace was the introduction of high relief and the striking contrast between the, um, the heavy motifs and the delicate bars that link them. You won't see any human figures or animals in this type of lace, but instead the designs are dominated by elaborate uh, convoluted leaves, flowers and fruit. And these vigorous contours uh, suited perfectly the Baroque style, uh, which was all about mass and movement. So unsurpri unsurprisingly, it became all fashion as soon as it ap appeared in the mid 17th century. And there was not a country in Europe that did not succumb to, uh, to this lace. Um, although now is often denoted by the French term, uh, grow, Point de Venice. Uh, in Venice, they had several names for it. Punto Venezia Relievi, Punto Rosaline, Punto in Aria, or Punto Tagliato a Fogliani. And this complex lace was slow and difficult to make. This treatise on lace making in Venice, published in 1878, provides a description of the process. First, the outlines of the design are drawn on a solid ground, preferably of a contrasting color. Then the lace maker begins by making the outlines with a thick thread. Once the outlines are in place, the fillings are worked. The exceptional variety of the filling stitches is the second most distinguishable characteristic of this lace next to the parts worked in high relief. The more diverse the filling stitches are, the better. And there were no set rules. As the author of the treatise puts it, the lace maker varies the patterns of the filling stitches on a whim, variando il disegno a capriccio. And indeed, they show such a rich and delightful range of ornaments from mesh, stripes and holes, to chevrons, diamond-shaped paints and lozenges. And very few designs for Grove Point de Venise have survived and little is known about the designers. One designer in Venice, Piero Cupilli, has signed a design of his, drawn on parchment, just like this one. Parchment was highly suitable for this quite robust lace, and because it was heavy, it sat especially well on men. It was well suited for neckwear, not only for cravat ends, but also for uh, collars. The patterns of the so-called um, bib-fronted collars were always symmetrical, unlike the ones on the caratans, because the caratans were bunched together, as Dick explained. So any strongly symmetrical designs would have been lost. 
And we are very fortunate to have in our collection this panel of unfinished Grob Point de Venise. It shows the stages of its construction as described in the treatise. So the parchment was mar marked out in ink um, with the shape uh, of the pattern required. Then a thicker thread was laid down along the pattern's outline held in place by threads taken through to the reverse side of the parchment. Then the lace was gradually constructed stitch by stitch on, um, uh, uh, on the parchment and the delicate um, uh, linking bars with picots uh, and the parts in high relief would have been work lost. Cordonets, uh, if you can see uh, there on the diagram, those are the raised parts, are obtained uh, by positioning a strand of about 50 threads, um, which would then be covered with compact buttonhole stitches. And when the lace was complete, the threads at the back um, would be cut, the finished piece lifted off, and the parchment was ready to be reused. The variety of the delicate uh, filling stitches give this lace a particular charm, and there are many um, different patterns work perfectly in contrast to the raised uh, cordonets. Uh, this approach to design, where each decorative element is broken down, so to say, into a number of differently patterned surfaces, was not restricted only to lace. And there are indeed many similarities shared between Venetian laces and the silks from the second half of the 17th century. And the shared characteristics, as you can see on the uh, detail of the silk on the, on the right, uh, <coughs> Uh, is the practice of creating this large single decorative element um, uh, from smaller but differently patterned surfaces. And all these distinguishable characteristics of Grog Point de Venise are incredibly faithfully depicted by Gibbons on the Cosmo panel. The loosely gathered flounce captures the essence of this elaborate lace with convoluted leaves and stylized lilies and pomegranates, um, the grid of linking bars with picots uh, as delicate as a cobweb in contrast with solid plump uh, cordonets and fancy fillings. And the wide range of many different geometric patterns of the fillings uh, and their distribution across the flounce make me think that Gibbons too, just like a Venetian lace maker, was choosing them on a whim or um, a capriccio, as the treatise uh, puts it. And his attention to detail is really astonishing. And you can tell that this, uh, 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 that his flounce uh, was carved after a highly elaborate example of Gros Point. Um, naturally, one can tell the difference, um, the differences between these laces when you put um, several side by side. So some patterns are more complex and detailed than the other, and naturally certain lace makers are evidently more skillful than the other. Um, so here, for example, the lace in the middle was more laborious to make uh, than the one on the left. Um, so you can notice, hopefully, uh, the simple uh, straight cordonets with picots. Those are the uh, 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 small protruding spikes <laughs> uh, on the left and uh, crescent-shaped, uh, nice and plump cordonets, uh, which are not trimmed with picots, but with loops, and it was that type of lace where cordonets are edged with loops that Gibbons went for. 
as if he wanted his carving to be as complex and as impressive uh, as possible. So was his um, model. Uh, the looped edged uh, crescent shaped cordonets feature on his cravat um, too. Uh, and though it is immediately apparent that the flounce on the Cosimo panel is more true to life, it is nevertheless evident that the lace of the cravat can be no other than Grove Point de Venise. The connecting bars uh, here are more wide, more robust, and without picots, but the filling stitches are delicate and varied and the effect of having two cravat ends on top of one, of, uh, one another is successfully captured with the motifs overlapping. And what always catches my eye <laughs> uh, are the merry, many short um, incisions um, that run across the coordinates. Um, and these quite prominent lines obviously represent the buttonholing stitches which are used to cover these bundles of threads that lay in the core of the cordonnet. So a skillful lace ma maker in the 17th century uh, working with extremely fine linen thread would be perfectly capable of, of achieving a very smooth surface of the cordonnet. Uh, which would then appear solid, not ripped, as you can tell from the one in the middle. In contrast, the one on the right is worked with a much thicker thread and you can see the ribs. So I was wondering about the Gibbons's choice to make the coordinates so um, noticeably ribbed. Uh, and I and I wonder, uh, was it perhaps uh, some sort of acknowledgement uh, of the lace making method, as if he wanted to say, this is not bobbin lace, this is needle lace, and I understand how it is made. I had um, uh, loads of opportunities to observe it from up close, and this is how, and this is how the threads are, are positioned. So it's just... Um, um, what crossed my mind. So to end with uh, uh, a couple of words about the Venetian lace making in industry, which was obviously uh, highly successful. Um, much of the lace was made in domestic settings or in so-called ospedali for young girls or in convents and crucial um, to the rapid expansion of the, of the industry was of course the patronage of the Catholic Church and the ecclesiastical leaders of the Counter-Reformation who played a major part in spreading this new style throughout Europe. And when we think of lace, we normally first think of small accessories such as lappets or carats or sleeve ruffles, but Venetian lace makers had, uh, uh, had elaborated the so-called the so part lace technique, and which means that they would split the large designs into sections, often down to a single flower head. Uh, for distribution amongst the number of workers. And this speeded up the production of each item and they were able to make large scale items, items um, like flounces or even altar frontals such as this uh, amazing piece uh, in our collection. Uh, finally, just to say that King Charles II paid 194 pounds for three Venetian lace cravats and the one that James II wore at his coronation costed 36 pounds. And with those figures in mind, just imagine how much this altar frontal would have, uh, must have been worth. So that's it from, <laughs> uh, from me and I'm passing the baton on to Claire. <laughs> Uh, hello and uh, 
Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Clooney Fratton, and in honour of the Grinlin Gibbons Tercentenary Year, I was asked by Nick Humphrey, who you saw in the first talk, uh, to recreate one of Gibbons most well-known carvings, uh, the Walpole Cravat. So the Victoria and Albert Museum <coughs> filmed the process as part of their How Was It Made series, which asked contemporary artists to explore the construction of a selection of the objects in the collection. Uh, I'll be taking quite a practical look at Gibbon's cravat during my talk, uh, discussing the way the carvings are made, thoughts that arose when I was working on the cravat, and my observations when I was examining the original. So as a carver, uh, working on the cravat's kind of a dream come true. You know, you, you, you learn about him very early in, on in your career and something to aspire to. Uh, but the most exciting part is that it gave me a chance to really engage with his carving firsthand, and that's something we don't often have the op opportunity to do as carvers. So carvers aren't trained in the theoretical process of carving or encouraged to design their own work when they first begin to study, uh, but we instead learn by copying existing carvings. Uh, so this is a process that encourages you to really look at and learn an object in a way that isn't possible just through observation. In order to replicate the shapes you make up an object, your hand needs to trace the same path as the person who originally carved it, and this gives you a really intimate portrait of them. So unfortunately, due to the fragility of wood carvings when compared to stone, there are much fewer surviving, uh, being copied by students time and again. And uh, the piercing and undercutting of some of the finer examples uh, make them very challenging to create casts from. <coughs> so this means that realistically, not many carvers actually get the chance to copy directly from Gibbon's work, unless they're lucky enough to be restoring it. So one of the challenges of recreating the cravat was in finding the best way to work from it. And it would have been impractical to risk copying from the original and uh, too nerve-wracking for me, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, but as part of their investigation into the carving, the v and commissioned this fantastic 3D print and the scan. And uh, that's what we ended up deciding I should work from. So this is just a side note, but I think this is a really exciting answer to the problem that I've just discussed. So modern technology has now made it possible for copies to be made from carvings that are too fragile or complicated to be cast using traditional methods. And this really opens up the chance for students to access some of the best works of art and learn directly from them. This is something I hope we'll see a lot more of in future as the technology continues to improve. So during Gibbon's time, carvers were largely trained in, in big workshops, the high volume of carvings, and they were surrounded by journeymen and master carvers. But as tastes have changed and the demand for ornamental carvings reduced, the large workshops have closed and most carvers now tend to work alone. Practically speaking, being able to work directly from pieces created by a master carver like Gibbon's could represent one of the best means of continuing to keep our carving heritage alive. And there's, despite there being 300 years between us, there's a tremendous amount to be learnt from, from copying him. So some background on the construction of the cravat. Nick's covered some of this already, but um, it's carved from a single block of lime wood and the grain's running vertically along the body of the carving. Uh, lime's a very fine-grained wood, which means it holds a lot of detail. Uh, there are some other timbers that offer more crispness, like boxwood and some of the fruit woods. But for Gibbons, lime represented a good marriage of availability, workability, and price. Gibbons' wood carvings are predominantly in lime, and he's credited with popularizing it in England, uh, replacing the heavier style of carving that was made necessary by working in oak. So you can see here, work begins by selecting the block and cutting out a rough outline of the carving. I've used a bandsaw here, but Gibbons would have been working by hand. After selecting a piece of timber, the shapes are roughed in using a chisel. Uh, besides some minor changes in steel manufacturing, the types of chisels we use now aren't too different from those used when Gibbons was working. Um, and the way we use them is very similar as well. So this is really gratifying when you're working directly from a carving because you can lay your tool against the marks that have been left by someone in the past and see exactly the size and shape of chisel that they were using at the time. Uh, this obviously wasn't possible with cravat. I wasn't daring enough to go near it with a chisel. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's nice to feel that connection with the original carver. 
So after forming the general shape and height, uh, work begins creating the folds of the cravat. Um, this was a nice place to look at Gibbon's approach to the cravat because he, he made a lot of very decisive incisions and it, that's pretty indicative of the way he carved the rest of the cravat too. So this is a photo of Gibbon's cravat that I took during my visit to examine the original and I think it's a, a really nice example of his approach to carving. Uh, what I found most interesting when I was working, when I was looking at the original, was how carefree some of the carving is. Uh, from a distance, the level of detail and texture gives us a sense of tremendous complexity. But when you look at some of the punch work or the fine veining cuts that make up the impression of lace, uh, you can see he's been very confident about the way he's approached it. He hasn't been precious while carving this, so there are places, uh, I'll try and point them out in a second, but there are places where the lace loops are an inconstant width, or the punch works deeper than others, or the decorative details have been cut quite roughly. Um, so you can see some here, and it's hard to make out. Uh, I think again here, some you know, not uh, terribly regular, but you can see these these places. Uh, but I think this is something that sums up some of the brilliance of Gibbon's approach. Um, he wasn't attempting to make something that was perfect in every detail. Uh, his, um, his carvings are, are working carvings, and the real skib skill is in making something that is actually quite simple in some respects look really weightless and complex. So this is especially obvious when looking at the back of the cravat. Uh, you can see here that the carving's been undercut exactly as much as it needed to be in order to give that impression of lightness from the front. And I'm, I'm really pleased that there are pictures of the back of it online and that it's been displayed in the round in the, in the exhibitions. Um, so I think a lot of people imagine that in order to give the appearance of lace, the carving has to be incredibly delicate. Um, and looking at the back, of especially this one, shows how robust it is for something that's so thin. Uh, so examining the back is also quite interesting because there are some revealing marks where he's punched through uh, with quite a lot of force even after it's been undercut. And this is another sign that he, you know, he wasn't precious about it. This is the point where the carving was most vulnerable and most delicate and he was happy to give it a real, a real good tap. So... This understanding of Gibbons about how to create the appearance of complexity in his carvings was a key part of the way he made it possible for people of varying skills to create them. He was first and foremost a businessman, and it wouldn't have been any use to him to design carvings which could only be executed by master carvers, uh, when he maintained a large workshop that employed carvers at different stages in their careers. A lot of Gibbons' carves, drops, and panels contain elements which are relatively simple to carve, but which create an appearance of abundance when combined with the rest. So a good example here are the uh, forget-me-nots that are underneath the rose, and this is his carving um, panel from St. James Piccadilly. Uh, and these are actually really simple shapes that an apprentice could execute well, but when you add them into the whole, they, they m make it a more interesting and complex piece than it would have been otherwise. <coughs> So this is something that I think separates Gibbon's work from the work of people who went on to work in the Gibbon style. So if you've been to the Bonhams or Compton Verney exhibition, uh, you'll probably have seen this piece by Thomas Wilkinson Wallace. And this is, I mean, just in an incredible piece of carving. It's, it's technically astounding in a way that I'm, some boxwood carvings are when you look at them and there are things that difficult to imagine how someone could have achieved that fineness, and particularly these very, very thin uh, twine that's tying up the birds. It's just, I'm going to say this is a carver would be very, very difficult to do. Um, so although Wallace was working in a much later date and in his own interpretation of the style, I think this is a, it shows some of the difference between Gibbons and the people he inspired. So I think it would have been probably quite tempting if you'd taken your legacy from Gibbons to want to try and do one better and do something, of, you know, push the, push the level of techni technical ability even further. Um, and he's, you know, he's definitely done this with this. But I think Gibbons showed the same combination of confidence and workmanlike approach that makes medieval carvings so beautiful. 
And there's a difference between looking at an object that someone slaved over in order to make it absolutely perfect in every aspect, and someone with a very high level of skill who's working very freely and confidently, but also accepting that occasionally errors do arise. And I think it's very humanizing. And I, I was quite touched when I was looking at the original in the VNA to see places where his chisel had slipped or he'd cut a little bit too deep and to see that there were these kind of remnants of his humanity. And I think this is part of what his, makes his carvings very beautiful to see. They're, they're not picture perfect. So Gibbons captured the spirit of the objects he was copying rather than replicating them exactly. And this in some ways makes them I think more real than a faithful copy. And this is exactly the same thing that botanical artists had to do when representing plants. So you, you're not aiming to make a completely faithful copy of one specimen, but either the species might vary quite widely uh, between different, different examples, but you're trying to capture the essence of the plant so well that anyone who's looking at the picture or anyone who's looking at Gibbons carvings can recognize that that is exactly that species. And uh, Gibbons did this in all of his work. You know, you, there are, I've, we've heard if you've gone to the VNA conference some fantastic kind of uh, uh, research into identifying the different species that he used and some of them quite exotic as well. So I, I think um, going back to Gibbons not being precious about his carving, I think this is one of the best lessons a carver can take away from him. Uh, there are just so many things I'd change if I redid the cravat and, and had another go at it. Um, and some of them, you know, naturally result from working primarily from a print, but there are, there are lots of them that just came from me knowing more now than, than I did when I worked on it. Um, Gibbons continued to grow in skill throughout his lifetime, but the abundance and liveliness of his work really paints a picture to me of a man who is always looking ahead to the next carving. Uh, rather than obsessing over the defects in his last. And this is a legacy of growth and innovation that I hope continues many years into the future. So, thank you very much. I just wondered with something like the cravat and these other objects, did they also have a pedagogical role as well as something you whip out of a drawer to impress a patron and say, well, actually, I can do this, or actually, do you pass it around in your workshop and say, this is kind of what we do? And so is there a sense in which not just the cravat, but other objects of virtue and virtuosity have that kind of existence? We know they do in drawings because we know that's how drawings are passed around in academies. And they're, you know, they're used, the actual word academy can mean a drawing, can mean an object that is copied. I'm just curious about, about their role beyond the, the, the wow factor, how do you do it, and the commercial factor as their practical role as models. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think they would have functioned as, as both. Um, and, you know, even if, the, even if they were pieces that were turning over in the workshop and in for a little bit of time, the, the, you know, the apprentices would have been given that chance to look and to observe how it was made. And I, I think it's very similar to in painting where you, you, you would learn by copying and, and, and looking at those, getting familiar with those motifs. And uh, traditionally speaking, at least in England, um, trainee carvers would learn by carving um, moldings over and over again to, mm. to kind of, so that there's that kind of tradition of, of copying and yes. getting familiar with the formats. And what you say is it's not about exactitude or, or, or verisimilitude at all the time, it's, it's making it seem like it is, yeah. which is fascinating. And that's exactly the same in painting. So when Van Dyck paid silk, yeah, when the closer you get, the less it looks like silk and the more you realise it's, it's the eye telling you yeah. that it is. That's, that's you know, the, the magic, I think, in, in painting or carving, really. It's, it's yeah. the, the looking like one material and, and not being that. And it sounds like an obvious thing to say, but yeah, it sort of never time. ceases to, to amaze, I think. And do you think that something like choosing something as horribly expensive and intricate as lace and say, well, if we can do that, <laughs> yes. then you can do anything, um, yeah, in, in, a, in a sense. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, it is a, a bit of a kind of show-off thing to Doesn't do, it? isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's, you can't yeah. get much more delicate than the impression of lace. So. Is there anything that any, uh, any of the other speakers want, want to add before we, we ask... Um, our audience to. Um, <clears throat> I think you're, you're, the point about 
um, pieces needing to look good, good enough is very important. And, and remembering that a, a piece like this, you know, what is sometimes characterised as, as trophy carvings, um, are really rather different from the bulk of what Gibbons produces over his long career. And we talk about Gibbons producing it, and you know, we think of the, the cravat or the Cosimo panel as being autograph from Gibbons' own hand. But the bulk of what, what is produced by his, under Gibbons' direction, is produced by uh, apprentices, journeymen, and assistants. He's running a big workshop, and this is part of his great genius. Um, and most of it, these large ensemble, ensembles like the Glories at Petworth House, are being mounted high on the wall, several, several metres above the eye, and um, they, they need to look perfect from, from ground level because nobody's up there examining it close to. You, you, you only have to get it right for the, for the viewer as they're going to see it. And that's, that's a big difference from this kind of work from the material produced by the yard for these big commissions that... Um, Gibbons is overseeing and he's probably actually not carving much of it himself. He's there quality controlling and ensuring consistency ac across metres and metres of, of work. Yeah. I think um, the language around Gibbons is quite interesting. Um, most, m most writing about Gibbons starts off talking about his unique genius. <laughs> Um, and then by about the third paragraph, people come to exactly that conclusion. Well, hang on, this was a monster business. Mm -hmm. um, so then you have to concede that it is possible, you, you know, that other people can do this. And that, I think that's what I'm quite interested in. You know, what else was out there and what does even the hand of Gibbons mean? And is it far more exciting that actually Gibbons created this whole genre, um, opened people's minds to the capabilities mm. of this material and unleashed this, these creative possibilities. Um, and you know, particularly with the Chatsworth cravat, you see the material being tested absolutely to its limits. It lacks the, the substructure, that, that fundamental understanding of what you can show on this side, supported by what's happening behind here. So to me, the cravat is this pinnacle of what somebody can achieve because it, it blurs material reality. It, pushes to the absolute limit. And I, it was so interesting the way you were talking about, you know, that moment of punching through when something is at its most delicate. You know, who does that? And that makes me start thinking about our cravat. You know, it's so much bigger, it's so much more delicate, there's this huge volume of space behind. Who is sitting there thinking, if they're aware of this, if they're aware of the Cosmo panel, thinking, I can do better than that. Who's got the guts to do that? <laughs> I, I want to know, I still want to know. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to find ways to, um, to, to show the cravat as you have, um, because I think seeing it in all those different dimensions from different perspectives um, allows you to see so much more. So I was really grateful to for, for showing it in that detail. Thank you. I actually thought it was quite interesting what you were saying about the, the V&A thinking that uh, the Walpole cravat might have come after um, the Cosmo panel, because I, I sort of instinctively always suspected that that was his sort of run up to it. So that the Cosimo panel is, you know, and you know whether the Chatsworth cravat is Gibbons or not, they they look much more difficult to carve to me. So I kind of thought he might have had a had a little go, or maybe he maybe he had done them first and thought oh, I'm, not, I'm not going back there again soon, and went for a mm. kind of more simplistic one, or but. It, when you, you, you Sylvia, were saying that it was, it's quite more stylized as well, um, a less faithful uh, representation. Yes, far more um, uh, faithful. Uh, mm. I, I've never, I never had a chance to see it in the flesh, unfortunately. And I, uh, as much as I tried, I could not find a very detailed shot, shots yeah. of the plants. I had that problem too. <laughs> it would be amazing to see it from up close, but. Mm. Um, from what I could tell, it was um, um, it's uh, much more sophisticated in that, uh, and, and far more successful in capturing what what this lace was. Mm. Um, um, 
not I'm not implying that of course uh, I'm not putting any um, you know the Karat is uh, as I said it has a very different take mm. to to the lace and I was always you know especially from when I was examining examining the, the Karat with Nick um, months ago uh, those uh, incisions that I was talking about um, uh, really puzzled me because when you <laughs> when you um, hold this lace in your hands when you're up close to it because the lace makers was the, the, those linen threads were as uh, fine as a, as a you know as a hair and when you and are working with very fine needles and l carefully lining those fine threads side by side though that coordinate becomes one smooth um, um, mm. uh, line. So I was always wondering why was it so important for him to make all these tiny incisions um, for the coordinates that were... Would, uh, uh, would it have been, this uh, is very out there, but would it have been possible to... Did people make uh, less uh, sort of polished imitations of lace work that had I don't know, more bold stitching? If, if they uh, use very thick, coarse threads, yeah. then it would show. Um, but coarse does not come together with expenses. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this was a luxurious product. So yeah. it, it's almost like needle, needlework lace observed under a, mis not a microscope, what, but magnifying glass. Mm. So mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the structure that you would get <coughs> if you if you were looking at the uh, stitches with mm -hmm. a, with a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. So that would yeah. So it would be great to see the Cosimo panel. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. see what's happening there with the coordinates. Um, but from what I was able to see, they are much more smooth, smoother, mm -hmm. much smoother than the. Okay, um, thank you very much. I just like because I'm aware of time. Um, could I ask if anybody had questions, comments, observations, information? Does anybody wants to to say anything at this point? Yes. Sasha, given your understandable sort of part of their anatomy, given first of what and the fact there's a contract that is with Watson and two or three other clubs, would you actually be able to identify? Well, what he didn't do. I think the drawings are really helpful. I mean, the chapel cartons are very similar to some of the ones that might pass. They are. Sort of they are. Um, I don't think it is possible. Um, I think better people than I have had a crack at it over the years. But I think what um, what has perhaps been absent for the other carvers is a champion. So Gibbons has always had a champion. The, the other carvers weren't on at Burley. The, well, they were at Burley before. Yeah. But Lobb and Maine and Davis and Young, they haven't had these champions as Watson and Gibbon has had. So they don't have the biographies. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to try and piece together what their biographies were, whether their drawings are there to be identified, because that's the benefit we've had of having Watson's drawings. We can conclusively say, this was his skill as a draftsman. He was invited to submit elevations. He was educating himself on flat art, on sculpture and other things. So we can begin to piece together what his education may have been and interpret what we see on the wall now, which we can't do with the other carvers. Um, and some I, of Watson's drawings are all given to carvers. Some of them are, um, uh, but often they, they are at different stages. So they're not carbon copies. Um, even in Watson's own drawings. So we can see that process um, where he's submitting drawings, they're being amended, the Duke's perhaps making suggestions for what they're And I don't know this. I mean, the ones of Gibbon can't, so you've got the James Gibbon, you've mm -hmm. got another one. In, yeah. In so I read that as him well. educating himself um, more than anything. <laughs> okay, Michael. I just had, I was very interested to see those drawings the Chatsworth drawings. First of all, are they all contained in one album or volume or something? Most of them are in one volume. So um, are they stuck on the pages or are they drawn on the page? 
there's a there's a couple of different ways that they're applied, and then there are some in Derbyshire Record Office right. that I haven't managed to see. So my next stage is to compare what what material is where. So all we know is that White Watson, the grandson, gathered it together, but I right. don't know how the Derbyshire tranche in the Record Office didn't come to Chatsworth as the other things did. Because the one thing that occurred to me. Is seem to me to be by the same person. You know, there are several hands here. Well, I, think I mean, that very accomplished drawing by, by a proper artist. Mm. And then some very rough drawings. Mm. And then there was a drawing with little pointy eyes, you know, little slicky dot eyes, very like Brendan Gibbons's own hand, actually. Well, I mean and it just struck me that these are not drawings by this one person. I think there is a huge amount of scholarship mm. still to be done. Mm. I think we're seeing somebody who had a long career, he's prematurely ending, he died in his early 50s. I think we're seeing the evidence of somebody probably sketching in situ, somebody reworking drawings. His architectural elevations are far more polished than his rough um, sketches. Um, so I think that's what makes having this type of information so exciting, mm. that there is so much more to be challenge, to be researched, to be compared and still to be drawn together. As I mentioned, the last big article on Watson was in 1998 by Trevor Brighton. So, you know, it, it's time, I think, um, that we had another look because uh, we're so much further forward. But also we've got those avenues of the other carvers um, to bring in what, what impact anything that remains of them might have on, on Watson in particular, but themselves. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I'm, I'm just adding to that. So I was very fortunate to have a look at the Chatsworth archive. And I also shared some of those images with Dr. Fanzi Sands from the Sony Museum. And, and as Michael pointed out, yes, I think there are potentially different hands in there that have been gathered together by the grandson um, to pay homage to Sammy Watson. And as Sasha said, um, these other cars don't actually have those same champions. Um, and as with Gibbons, it's so often the case that so much gets attributed to him because he's the, the golden figure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, can I just ask yes, a question? Yes, absolutely. Well, Please ask a question. Um, this, this is to do with the idea about <clears throat> the incisions. Is, is it possible that really, in a way, the lace is too perfect, that if Gibbons were to try and recreate that, it might look as though he's failed in his task of recreating it because no, it, it, it would look so smooth and, and to a you know to a, a, another person viewing it, would they perhaps perceive it as being unfinished or uncarved? I, I wouldn't say, you know, we use the word, word failed, that's a bit too uh, I, I didn't yeah I didn't want to say that he that the Cosimo panel was more successful or anything the, the, the take is different to begin mm -hmm. to begin with with Cosimo panel you have a deep border one one piece of lace with the Corvette you have two um, two panels of lace overlapping so that's uh, the, that's one thing to take into consideration so it could be also that that contributed to it sort of different take that he had on how to carve it with the incisions. I cannot answer the question. It's just something that, um, you know, struck me as, um, you know, simply why would you make something that's invisible to the naked eye so evident <laughs> in the carving, if you know what I mean. I mean, with needle lace, the easiest way to explain, it's like embroidering and you have embroidery of different qualities, obviously. And with, you know, with needle painting, you cannot see the threads. You can barely see them, that's the point. And uh, those lace makers were as skillful as the embroiderers who could do needle painting. So you would not see the threads. The idea is that your eyes your eye is tricked into not seeing them, just one smooth surface. surface. Mm -hmm. So smooth and ripped, I don't know what's happening, what's, why, you know. 
uh, the textures are, are, are like that. So, um, just speaking as someone who's seen a lot of lace <laughs> and not as much as, you know, the wood carving. And I was, I was astounded learning from, from you a little bit about lace, the, the levels of intricacy and labour that, mm. you know, even a cravat is, is probably involves the work of, of numerous lace makers because it's, because it's so laborious and the best needle lace is, uh, uh, you'll correct me, but it, it's hundreds and hundreds of stitches per centimetre. Uh, uh, so, you know, they, they, yeah. the, the comparison between the two crafts is, mm. is so, so far apart. Yes, um, and that whole notion of craft and art obviously rears its head all the time. You know, is, is there a Grinling Gibbons of lace making? You say, oh my God, so and so is that, you know, you know or, 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 or is it an, an anonymous thing? And also, when we think of stone carving and wood carving, which, which in, and the hierarchy you know, yeah. is, is also an interesting question, isn't it, about where Gibbons himself could, you know, are you just somebody who makes things, who air copies, or are you, as a sculptor, are you like a mm. painter? Are you somebody who is a primarily creative? Um, so it's funny, I don't really yeah. know where the division exists, because there's, but there there's is, so much, there is, there is that division, but there's aspect so much creativity in Gibbons' yeah. work. Yeah, and and yet you think, you yeah. know, um, and yet there are stone carvers, there are stone masons, there are stone sculptors in, yeah. in the same way yeah. that there are with wood. And I think the just to, uh, um, the drawing aspect was fascinating. Michael mentioned this, the draw, the drawing. And I don't know how many carvers draw, how many carvers think is absolutely integral. And there are no some carvers who don't really draw. And they, they yeah. you know, to them it's not. But there are others who it's absolutely part of their being. You know, I um, think if you. If you can do one, then it, it you have to use the same skills for both. So, it, it, if you can do a fantastic drawing and then work straight from that, then that's mm. that's an advantage in, in working faster. So, I, I think you definitely see a lot of who you know, maybe not with local drawers survive, which mm. is why it's so fantastic that mm. Chatsworth has this collection. But mm. And the, the, the Michael's point, I think, is a valid and important one about about drawings that survive because they do get put into albums. And I know mm. with I know more about life drawing and that sort of, uh, and drawing some sculpture, often you, you, they would put together the, a workshop. So you might get a Lily in there, but you also might get something yeah. by somebody who just happens to be passing through the workshop. And then we all think, that's not very good. Oh gosh, that's very good. Uh, <laughs> they might just you know, be having a bad day. Sweepings from the floor and all sorts of things. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring proceedings, if I may, to, to a close, but I'd like, Hans, do you want to come up and say a little bit about, about because I know this is your penultimate. Yes. Event, and I think this is as much about about what you've been doing as, as, as about the cravat. So well, I'm going to let you just round off. Well, thank you. Um, yes, it, it, this has been a, a year about celebrating the the life and the the legacy of of Grinling Gibbons. Um, the the society was was set up to to master plan uh, a festival in his honour. Um, but what was really important behind that was to actually bring more attention to his work, but also to unpick, as we, we have done tonight, a lot of those questions that, um, that present themselves. And the hand of Gibbons is a, a question that we come back to repeatedly, trying to understand what that means. Um, and I think the point has been amply made tonight, that it isn't just about what's actually been achieved by his very own hand, it's about the influence that he's given to carvers across the, the succeeding 300 years. So coming to the end of the, the, the tercentenary and the, the work of the, the GGS, I think we were able to you know, look back with a great deal of pleasure at what we've actually managed to uncover and think about over the past 12 months, reviewing his objects and thinking about who might have been behind some of those and all the people involved in his workshop and then, of course, as I say, looking ahead to his legacy and the, the making of, of craft and sculpture and carving today. So, yes, the tercentenary is coming to an end, but we hope the legacy of our tercentenary, as well as the legacy of Gibbons, will, will continue. So we have a lot of projects underway to, to try and document his works. We have something called Grinling Gibbons Online, which is a resource that brings together 
um, his works from around the country from multiple collections and the BNA has led the way of course with, with supporting that and we, we look forward to, to growing that and com continuing to, to share information and, and prompt further research and discussions. So yeah, it's, it's really truly very exciting to have seen this take place tonight and, and the recording that has happened of it will be again shared as part of the, the resources that are coming out of the tercentenary. So thank you all so much for, for coming and, and supporting it. And my heartfelt thanks to our four fabulous speakers, our wonderful chair, and of course, Strawberry Hill for, for hosting this. It's mm. been a, a mm. wonderful, wonderful evening. I'd like to think that both Gibbons and Walpole would be delighted um, with everything that's taken place. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.